And welcome to Rich Sports. Thanks everyone that's tuning in a bit earlier than normal, but hopefully I can do a few more earlier podcasts. And today we're doing a podcast because something's actually happened in the transfer window, something actual we can talk about, and that's the signing of Mason Mount. And on welcome bath time, we did mention Mason Mount, I think, probably maybe a couple of months ago when we were doing some tactics podcasts talking about midfielders, which may have attributes which might benefit how we want to play in the future. So thanks for agreeing to come back on bath time. Good to speak to you for what's been... It's probably been at least a few weeks, maybe longer, actually, since we did something. Yeah, I suppose so. But people don't know about the absolute drivel that I send you on Twitter. Um, like pictures of sharks that I've seen, Love Island uh, roundups, like they, they don't know. Um, but yeah, really uh, pleased to be back. It's nice to see you again. And um, even more importantly, it's nice to see uh, Niall is finally occupied with a little bit of YouTube. Yeah, thank you, Niall. Thanks for and thanks for people that do message me and ask when I'm when I'm streaming. It's good to know that people en enjoy some of the content we put out. And thanks, Mo, as well. And thanks, Jeff. Jeff, I'm always late, Jeff. Just um, it's a, it's a guide, isn't it? As a, a time, we're not late. Guide. We started um, at seven thirty. And James, hope you're good. And let's go straight into it. Mason Mount, that. I'm going to go on social media a bit. I think, for me, I would say, and also shout out to Matthew. Cheers, Matthew. Hope you're good. That it's quite good to see how annoyed Chelsea fans have been regarding this, because I think that's a good sign in terms of like any player you're getting. Obviously, he's been a good player for Chelsea, despite what they say. And at 24, I think Manchester United are actually doing something that we haven't done for a while in a few years ago, we used to sign players that were, I don't want to say past it, but I think Cavani's best years were not in his late 30s. And I think players that are 17, 18, 19 are ones for the future. I think we're getting a player that's 24, a lot of England appearances, really good Premier League player. I think it's good to actually talk about a player. I'm quite excited actually by Mount. And mm. just before um, I let you talk, just say, Rajat, thank you as well. And hell, thanks for joining. We're actually streaming at a different time. So for some people that say I stream too late, this is a good opportunity to to come and have a chat. Sorry, did you ask me a question? Like, I've completely um, forgotten. No, I think I just said that I thought it was a good signing and we're going to talk about Mount and take it away bath time. Um, all right, Mason Mount. Um, so, because Niall's here, I always feel a bit of pressure because I know that Niall finds the tactics incredibly boring and this is... This is like the highlight of the last three weeks for Niall. So uh, I don't want to get straight into um, tactical things. Um, so what I will do is I'll tell you a couple of things about Mason Mount that my research has led me to. Um, I think the most interesting thing that I've seen about Ma uh, that I've seen from Mason Mount is that he outperforms his expected goals in every season by one bar one for Chelsea. Now, with the amount of bloody chances that United miss, I mean, it's sort of like, is it the parable of the sower in the Bible where, like, there's a bloke out just throwing throwing seeds everywhere and seeing what, the, what will happen? I think um, so. That's kind of like our yeah. approach in the penalty box. Just let's see, you know, let's have a little see what's going on and try loads of silly stuff. So to have a player um, that outperforms his expected goals more often than not for one, I'm a fan of that. And secondly, I had a look at where these goals were coming from. On, on average, they were coming from just over 20 yards out. And um, I'd love to know in chat if anyone knows how, what, how big a pe uh, the penalty box is. Just to give you an idea of where he's scoring goals from. I'll give people a little while. Well, I was saying it's good to actually, we, we talked about this recently, didn't we? And people were saying that that's one thing the team is lacking is goals. People look towards a striker, but I think to be a better team overall, having players in midfield that can contribute as well, I think Mount will be good. I mean, Chelsea are not really being renowned as having high goal scorers in their team. I think one year, was it Jorginho, the penalty taker, their top goal scorer? Mm. So I think Mount's made a big contribution. Well, I mean, his, his expected assists are also on average seven. Which is about, which I think is what Rashford contributed last season in the league. So, when you when you think about that, um, 
It, it, it is 18. It, it, well, it's called the 18 yard box, isn't it? Um, so. In here, Jeff, it was just a test. It's, it's, his average distance is just outside the box. Which is... Yeah, it's in the D, actually. It's 20 yards, it's basically the D, which is zone 14 which is where most goals come from. So that tell that tells you something about Mount that um he's that he's a good sort of like um second second phase finisher. Uh, like second phase of attack. So when you're when we're playing against low blocks and things, having the ability to score from just on the edge of the box is um is important because it oh Jesus, sorry. All right. Um I've just read a comment Excellent stuff, brilliant. Be specific. Um, we're going to go into specifics later, and I'm going to tell you why uh, Mount actually is is going to cause tactical issues for Man United. I respect anyone who likes tactics and stuff like that, but if you can be specific about what you mean, then like we can we can have a much more interesting conversation. Then, uh. Great. Okay, I'll just finish. I'll just finish my point on um, on Mount before we get into where he's going to play and stuff. All right. the The interesting thing about Mount is he's not as prolific as Bruno at goal scoring. Neither is he as creative as Eriksson. Um, he's a sort of like he's an in between player, and um, uh, yeah. Okay, I can't be bothered to read all this out. It's time. It's time for pictures, isn't it, Rich? Yeah, I think so. This is this I is what we're get, here the, for. the question of price, I suppose, is it'll time will tell if it's a good deal or not. I think Chelsea were op- hoping for seventy. I think it's just the the price players cost these days. All right, can you let me know when everything's yeah, up and we're, running? We're we're on on screen. Okay. All right. So to anyone that's new, I always say this: I can't stand formations. Um, I hate them. They're ugh, they're counterproductive and um, they're just used by people to make stuff up. So on Sky Sports or something, you will see you will see this as the Man United formation of four three three, very standard. We're we're going to see one or two variations um, played by Ten Hag and big up all my rest defence fans. All right. So as everyone knows, the rest defence is three is three people central. Which in this case we would say Casemiro, Martinez, and Varane, and then you can either go, you can invert your fullbacks, which uh, Ten Hag doesn't like doing, um, or you can play a three and a two like that. Okay, right. I'm gonna move all the attacking players out of the way. This is our defensive unit as it currently stands. This represents a problem because there is no one to play next to Casemiro. From this lot here, that's the first thing with the mount signing. So we'll we'll come back to this, but what we are likely to see is a box. Okay, and this here, uh, where's my pen? That there is the box. Okay, and uh, the reason you play the box is because you're essentially making a four versus three. And you're able to pass. Uh, you're able to pass out a lot. Now you can do variations on the box, where you can bring it into a diamond, for example. But this means that your rest defence isn't quite as strong, even though you have more passing angles. But that is um, that's a sort of personal preference. So we're we're very likely to see this from Manchester United. Um, where we're going to go compact on the left hand side, and we're going to have Anthony providing the out the output. Now, uh, Rich, do you remember why why we go compact, like just on one like on one half or one quarter of the pitch? I think this is to try and it's easier to defend half the pitch. No, this is in possession. In possession. Um, All right, it's fine. It's my head. I'm struggling to remember. Uh, It's to help us protect against transitions because um, the more compact you are, uh, it means that your counter press is more effective. 
right? So when in the past we've talked a lot about combination wingers, which I have Rashford is here, and direct wingers. So what you have with this box midfield is you have the ability to recycle the ball and get it out into these areas here to widen the pitch when you move into something called third play, uh, third phase play. Okay, so Mount is going to be an interior player, and interestingly enough, I'll just uh, we'll, I'll go back and sort of go through the comments just before we actually get into some proper details. Interestingly enough, I looked at Mount's um, uh, stats and performances uh, before this show started. And Mount was far better in the right half spaces than he was in the left half spaces. So it is a possibility. I don't see it happening. There is a possibility that Man United could move to attacking primarily down the right instead of the left and having Rashford as the direct winger. But unfortunately, with this man here, Varane, I'm not so sure that that is going to happen. Um, so what I suspect we're going to see is... Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll read what people are saying first, then I'll come back. and I, I don't want to just talk for an hour and a half about... If anyone's got any questions, get them in and we'll have a look at them. A lot of people are just talking about the price to start with. People... Why is that always... A th I mean, like, it's not up for me to tell you what you should be interested in or not, but... I always, I always find it very funny that people get so worked up at a price. It, like, that doesn't matter. I think it's like I mean, anything that 55 million sounds like a crazy amount of money, but then Chelsea paid over 100 for players. And it's just, I think it's just how much they cost at the end of the day. So I agree with James. James is just saying it's just what the market is. If anyone has any specific questions about that, hi, Box. Box said it's a bit early. I guess Box means like the time rather than the season. It's a bit early well, box, but, you know, something's happened, so we've got something to talk about. I think that the, the other thing is, is that um, we're all very aware of inflation in our own lives, um, but we don't. But we always sort of seem to be two or three seasons behind in football, um, where, like, a player that everyone thinks is 40 million, um, you know, they would have been three years ago, but because inflation has gone up and stuff, they're at, they are forty, they are fifty five, sixty million now. Like people have hard price points of twenty five, fifty, seventy five, hundred, and things like that. And so when you're like looking at value and stuff, you have to. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, Mo, I've seen Mo has got a question here saying about attacking from the right. You mentioned Varane. I'm going to say it's probably because of passing out from defence. But it, um, Mo is saying, the, what issue do you see with with that? And Fox uh, did say to start at... See, Bath Tom's watching Love Island. Mm, That's why we're before it. Yeah. It's um, it's Casa more like recoupling drama tonight. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it like, did make I'm a lot very... of sense when you, when you put the formation in possession and showed the box and showed about how um, we want to be a more possession-based team. And obviously, having a goalkeeper that's that's better in possession is one, but also having midfielders that are better in possession is another. So I think, for me, that the signing makes sense because just from that graphic you showed for a few minutes, you can see there's there's more possibilities of recycling possession if we run into problems going down that side. Um, one thing I would say is that I've, I saw loads of things about the number seven, and to be honest, it's I, don't, I think it might be an American-based thing where you retire numbers that people... Are concerned about the number seven in Manchester United. Just lucky that they had some very good players in that that number. But I mean, recently we've had Owen and other players, so I don't see it being an issue at all. Let's just make it great again. That's you know, like like every number is an important number because it's your number and it's the one that represents you, and you've got to make it stand for something. Um, so, bound good good luck to him. Um, Oh, Jeff's experimenting with some football terminology. Okay, so for third phase play is creative. Is creative play? It come. You have three phases of play. You have build up, which is where the goalkeeper is involved, and that is essentially about beating the first line of the press, right? The first line of pressure. Um, you then have something called progression, which um, is basically getting your team set up the pitch. 
Um, and then you have third play, third phase play, which is the creative phase, which is you know where typically you would have your five stretched across the box with the rest defence behind, and you'd be looking to exploit zone fourteen by overloading half spaces, wide areas, all these sort of things. Um, so to enter third phase. I don't know what that means. Um, uh, and this this is more stuff. Um, but yeah, I think that um, I think that Mount is um, is is going to be a good signing. But he represents a real tactical problem for Manchester United, and it starts with the, the fact that you cannot trust Bruno Mount and Casemiro to protect the centre of the pitch. Okay, like, as much as everyone laughs at McFred, McFred did a pretty good job of protecting the centre of the pitch, which is two of them. Like, Casemiro is slow, um, he's he's got very poor discipline, and he goes to ground too much. Mount is a very good front-footed defender, Meaning that in the final third and impresses and things, and we'll get we'll, we'll get to that um, a little bit later about how that's another issue is where is Mount going to be in the press? Um, but uh, Bruno is just a, is like Bruno is just runs around a lot, but can't even bloody curve his runs. You put those three together, and we're going to get cut through. D we're going to get cut right through because. Um, there's just there's not enough defensive mindedness and there's no one there who sees their first role as protecting the centre. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, let, let's talk. Uh, I've just seen Jeff asking if you missed. Yes, Jeff. Okay, so Varan, uh, Varan has a big problem in his game apart from his uh, apart from fitness issues and stuff like that. Um, it's that he is not able to break lines with passing, so he can't break the first line of pressure with a pass the same way that Martinez can. Um, and what that means is is that he tends to carry the ball up to the first line of pressure, uh, which it which sort of kind of plays into the hands of the of the opposition. Um, so if you were to look at games like uh, was it Leeds at home where he was really poor in the first twenty minutes. Um, he's just he's he's not a progressive um, out from the back player, and I believe that the coming agendas. This is my prediction. The coming agendas in the next eighteen months will be that Casemiro is too slow and Varane's not good enough on the ball. That would be that would be my my predictions. Um, right. Shall I? Shall we get on to um, some some more pictures? About stuff. Yeah, let's let's go for. Go for uh, it. I haven't done this for bloody ages. Uh, entire screen. Is this what I want? Well, hopefully, Mo. Hopefully, that answers your question. I'm alive. You are. You are. All right. Okay. So, this is kind of what we're talking about. So, in final phase play, you expect something like this, where you have a you have your attacking unit of five. And you can see that pretty much all the spaces are occupied uh, across. You then have your rest defence. And you can see what the problem here is. Varane, I'm going to take him out. He can't play, in a, he can't, he can't play next to Casemiro. Wambasaka, mm, to low maybe. One of these two, Shora Martinez with the current squad, is going to have to play... Next to um, next to Casemiro, it's it's going to be sure. It, the way we will set up will be something like this, I think, at the moment. Um, and that's a re and this is this is a problem, right? Oh, and okay. So, for example, if you were thinking about having um, McTominay or someone here, I'll tell I'll, sh I'll show you why. I should have said this earlier. Um, this is how we attack. How we defend is we defend in a very standard Premier League 4-1-4-1 block, right? You've seen, you've seen this. Even against City, we did this. We defended in this block. Every team, whether it's City or Arsenal, will go into a block when their first line of pressure is beaten from a, a press or a counter press, right? Is, that, is, is everyone agreeing with that or...? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah. So, um, so what that means is, is that in the when you move your attacking unit up here and out of the way, in order to play the box, one of your players in defence has to come up and uh, play next to next to your man. This is why Zinchenko is very important. This is why John Stones is very important because it allows you to defend essentially in a 4-4-2 and it allows you to attack in a 3-2 or a 2-3. So we have this issue because we're not doing this, right? We get killed week in, week out if we play this with Mount, Bruno and Casemiro protecting the centre of the pitch. Like it's it's not good enough. So this is this is the first problem that we have with Mason Mount because he's the number seven and he's going to play every week. Is that we have got two players that I think can do it. Does I mean does anyone think that Aaron Wambasaka can play inside? Like as in as in the the inside the interior. I'd probably say no, but it'd be interesting to get his biggest fan. George, but I don't think George is, is watching at the moment. I, um, I don't think anyone has ever mentioned that as a strength, have they? All right. So with, um, I'm just stop now because I, I did actually want to talk to people and so they're just shouting at my screen. Um, I want to talk about Sean Martinez. And as long as everyone agrees with the points that I've laid out in principle, uh, I want to know who people want playing next to Casemiro and why. Um, and also think about the drawbacks. So we'll start off with you, yeah. Rich. There's a question here, actually, as I say before I start. With um, about Casemiro, Bruno, Eriksson, midfield, is that Mount Dreadful. offers more? Le obviously, off the ball, I think he's got a lot more energy, like we mentioned about Casemiro. Um, yeah, it's difficult. Do you think it's? Do you think it's going to be an interesting season where we we find that like a few things get tried, some things don't work, but it might be also getting a new goalkeeper. It might be a very different style of play for some players so i'm wondering whether it'll be like when some players move to city that maybe there'll be a few sort of strange mistakes or performances that people don't quite get what they're supposed to be doing what do you think I it'll mean, be smooth no I, I th yes and no i think that the introduction of a pass it of uh, anytime you bring a new style of play into a football club or you put players in like um you know i, I remember my years in chile trying to work out how to counter press and took me a very long time to understand what I needed to do it it take it does when you're learning something new um unfortunately you have to learn by mistakes so there will be if we get an honor there will be mistakes coming and remember that Old Trafford has eaten goalkeepers alive for 30 years so it, it might be a bit problematic next season could you just bring that comment back about pressing and Ericsson and Casemiro and things I think there's some yeah, corrections sure. needed here um I didn't like Casemiro, Eriksson and Bruno. I like McTominay, Eriksson and Bruno uh, because McTominay protected the pitch better than Casemiro did. Um, but I do. I think Casemiro is, is a good player. I don't think he's a defensive player. Um, he, um, but I, I like his character and I like the stuff that comes out. Do you think Mount could do him. some of the things that McTominay does but have more no. quality? So that's cause I'm just looking at. Jeff's question here saying, can Mount defend deep in our half, or is he going to be? So it's full liability. Well, it definitely is a lot more mobile than Ericsson. All right, all right. Like, Ericsson, like, I'm seeing quite a lot of stuff here about I think full liability is a bit harsh, Ericsson. It's, it's, not, it's nonsense. Ericsson um, r ran more than anyone else in our team for the majority of the games. Like, it was very touch and go between him and Bruno. He performed brilliantly in the block and when he played as a double pivot next to um McTominay like in that do you remember that like Liverpool game where we were coming in off the back of Brentford and Brighton Ericsson was brilliant in that game um the the problem with Ericsson is is pace uh, and that's not that's not a problem if you have him next to someone who can sort of cover but you can't play Ericsson and Casemiro together like you're you're gonna get you're gonna get cut through, and I think that the general sentiment is that people would prefer to have Casemiro in the team rather than Eriksson, um, and that Eriksson's a good bench option. I'm not 
100% sure that that's the case, but I, th I think that's the sort of prevailing feeling. Um, uh, take some... Okay. Um, but I, I want to know, I want to know about um, Shaw, Shaw and Martinez and which one you... Because like, wan and I tell you, I'm going to tell you now, he can't, he can't play inside. I'm not sure about Delo playing inside. Um, but then, but the prop, the thing is, is that they're much better those two at defending wide areas than they are at defending central areas. So I don't think there's, there's any point taking them into consideration. Martinez and Shaw, one of them's got to play in that John Stones role. Rich, who are you picking and why? And to everyone else. Yeah, I would say the the two best options of all the defenders. Who would I pick? All right, let's put it. Let, maybe this lean is towards Luke question. Shaw. Actually, I would probably lean towards Luke Shaw, but I think it's, I don't know. All right, let, let, let's put it a different way. What do we, who do we lose? Where do we lose more from having um, one of those players in the role? So Martinez is alongside i don't know tyrone mings is probably the best um left-sided progressive passer in the pre in the premier league like um when you think of like center backs that are able to get you out of um out beyond the line of the first line of pressure in first phase, phase build up martinez is I, I i think he's probably the best in the league i, I can't think of many who are better than that so if you put Martinez next to Casemiro, you are losing out in the build-up because he's receiving, not distributing. Sure, right, Heli, or my apologies if I can't pronounce your name, um, which is almost certainly the case, so sorry. Um, sure, what's, what is Luke Shaw's like, best attributes like in attack? Anyone? I give people a little bit of time. I mean, well, if, talking, if you I'm decide who you would pick, I would say, um, yeah, Luke Shaw. I think it's good going for, I would prefer to see him further forward than Martinez out of the two players. I'm picking Martinez uh, on the basis that I think that um, Shaw is absolutely vital to our left side combination play. Like Shaw, Marshall, and Rashford. Absolutely. Like, when they were on song, they were unstoppable. I think that Shaw's really, really good in wide areas, and, and that includes defending wide areas. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but any time that Martinez was exposed and made to look a bit silly last year, um, there was an Everton player that did him that I saw Dan James absolutely do him at Craven Cottage, and obviously Salah did him and they were all in wide areas because Martinez is not as good at defending out wide as he is at defending centrally. Otherwise, he'd be he'd be a left back, like because of his height. That's where you'd think he'd play. But Martinez is better at defending central areas. So I, I would actually, I would have Martinez next to Casemiro because I think that he's got, you know, he's got short little legs, he's got good touch, he can pass the ball, um very well but i think that um i think that shaw is the better defender out wide and that would be my reason that would be my reasoning for it yeah there's a question about dallow i'm not sure if dallow um box has got questions about do we want i think a lot of this question comes along the nature of do manchester united want to play in this style because somebody put a comment up earlier saying about um copying i think it's copying pep style i think we will we want to see Man manchester united fans i can't speak for all of them but i think a lot of us have watched games recently where you watch us struggle for possession against brighton and think we want to see us playing in a way which we can retain possession we can control the game a lot more so i would like to have whether, whether it's copying pep guardiola's team or whether it's i mean look at the success they've had i wouldn't mind that sort of success so i would probably say yeah i would, I would yeah, want box different roles. what what you're sort of like 
what you're saying here, this is a proper cake cadet comment, is um, like when United won the treble, do you think everyone else was saying, God, uh, we don't want a team like that? Like, who wants this fast, exciting counter-attack at, like, direct football? Uh, I, d I disagree I think you about success, don't you? And you think, I want success. Because I can see Arsenal moving towards that style of play. And look what they achieved last season. OK, they didn't win a trophy, but some of the football, particularly the first half of the season, was incredibly good. And I think they got they... more points than we have since Fergie. Like last season, Arsenal, did they get 83 and or 84 or something? 83? I don't know. And, and we got 81 with Mourinho. And that's our highest points total since Fergie. Uh, actually, um, Rajat has reminded me of something. Um, the pro One of the problems with putting Martinez in the midfield, like as um, the uh, left side pivot or whatever, um, is that when we transition into a 4-4-2. It's quite difficult for that player to get central. Like, um, And it would be the same for Lindelof, unless Lindelof went to right back. I don't think he's got the qualities. Um, I think that we really need a left foot in that um, in that midfield, which is why we've, we've been like, you know, twerking for Rabio for so long. Um, but I just don't think that Lindelof um, is good enough to play in the Premier League at central... As, as as a central player, I don't think he's got he's got it inside. It's it's to do with his hips and his legs and his touch. I don't think he can operate in tight spaces and things. But to get back to Mount, Mount can absolutely operate in those spaces. He dribbles with his bum. He's got little legs. Um, but one thing that's quite nice about Mason Mount is um, it's one of the few players that I see in the Premier League that has a good running form, like. Um, when you see people like him or Declan Rice, you'll see that their body is very upright and straight and their arms quite compact when they're running. And when you look at Harry Maguire, a legitimate criticism of Harry Maguire is his arms are going like windmills when he runs. He looks like an, an amateur. Like I'd love someone to go into United and teach them how to run properly because so many of them like have got really poor techniques and it's very important. Um, so... Lindelof's like a player we haven't mentioned for a while, but he, he's a player also that his passing is pretty good. But you think yeah. he's got other negatives in his game that would keep him out of the, the starting lineup most most times? Um, I've uh, I've heard a convincing argument that Aaron Wambasaka might be a good right sided centre back in a back three. Uh, if you think of like a Kanji at Manchester City where his prim his primary role is to defend the wide area. But like is to play central, not really do anything on the ball, contest it, but defend in the wide areas. And there's very few players better than Wan Basaka defending the touchline. Like he's pretty poor outside of that, but I, I think um uh I I wouldn't be surprised if Ten Hag and his boys think about maybe trying Wan Basaka at right-sided centre back in pre-season or something, just see how he gets on because he has he has qualities that could make him excel. Might play there. to his strength, which I think yeah. would be key. But he he's so poor at judging his distances, though. Like I mean, I would I would hope that his performance in the FA Cup final means he will not be our starting centre back for next season. Like I know De Gea is at fault for base for you know pretty much everything according to everyone. But if you look at the second goal, it's Wan Basaka's job to get out to um, the three on the edge. It was him and Ericsson who had to get out. Ericsson was two yards ahead of him. Like Wan Basaka turned up, he just he just didn't judge his distances correctly, and you can't be a Premier League footballer if you do that. I don't want Mount. I don't want Rashford at nine. Um, Rashford would have to put a lot of um, muscle on. Uh, to play to play central, um, I don't think it's his best position. But you do bring up an interesting question, uh, which is, I want to talk about pressing. Uh, so I'll get this up here. All right, am I am I up, Rich? Yeah, you're on screen. Okay, right. We, I know, I know, boys. We have done pressing to death on this channel that we've talked about 
counter pressing, into out presses, out in presses. Done it all the bloody time. Right. So this is your this is a, a standard like this is your standard press, okay, or press exercise here. Mount is interesting, right? Because what you normally get is um yeah, uh is you have the central players man marked and then you have your nice narrow front three playing against the ball. In this system, Mount would be one of these players marking the eight or the six. This doesn't play in to Mount's attributes, where Mount is much better um, in the wide area of the three. So, with Anthony and Rashford, I believe they're our starting wingers for next season, we, we can't trust them to come play central. Like, would you trust Rashford to pick up De Bruyne or Silva or Gundogan or someone? Abs absolutely not, would you? Would you? No. I... Yeah, sorry. Um, so I was distracted. Mount... Hi, JR. Hope you're good. Yeah. So Mount, if he's this number eight here, doesn't improve our press. Unless... The... Unless... Someone from the press drops back into this role here. And I wonder... I wonder about Harry Kane quite a lot at the moment. Because the one player I can think of that would be a central striker that would be absolutely fine working in this area here, allowing, say, Rashford to go central and Mount to come out here, would be Harry Kane. But... If we want to get the best out of Mason Mount and have him in the first line of pressure, we need a striker that is going to be able to play midfield. Okay, and that just and that that doesn't mean just defend in the midfield. It means like protect the centre of the pitch, because if we then get Mount out into these situations here, like I'm sure everyone remembers that sort of like one of the goals with press is to get players in these areas here because the touch line is such a great defender of the ball, um, is, is the best defender in the world. So, um, you know, the ball gets the ball gets passed out here. Um, your six will come up here, 10 will go there, nine will go there, 11 goes there, this guy comes in central. Um, where do they go? This guy has to drop, play it in. Everyone's marked. There's nowhere to go. It gets booted and we pick it up. Right? Mount is excellent in these areas. Uh, and the reason... He's, he's excellent for two things. Uh, he's excellent at two things in the press. The most important part of pressing, and probably one of the hardest things to learn, is that um, you want to arrive as the player takes their first touch. Okay? If you look at Fred, Fred is... Fred lacks in a lot of areas, but he is consistently incredible at arriving as the player takes his touch. It's, I've never seen a player that's so good at doing it. The other thing is, is he, curves, he curves his runs properly, cutting out passes, and Bruno, for example, uh, doesn't do this. Rashford's not great at it. Like None of our team... But they haven't, you know, they haven't played a press before, and they got to Gea in training, so it's, it's not really going to help, is it? Um, but Mount is great in these areas here, but we will need a we will need someone from the front three to drop back in order to make the most of it. Where he will improve us, I think, the most is that if we just get everyone into uh, into a kind of block. Um, so when you're in when you're in a block and something like that. Uh, let's put Mount over here. Um, do you remember I told that story about how uh, in my teams we do pop and crab? Yeah, so everyone knows to press. At the yeah, so this is so when time. we go into a block, everyone shouts crab, and if you hear someone shout crab, you have to shout crab. But when we transition from the block to the press, we shout pop, and this is where I think Mount is going to be um, is going to improve um, our sort of like aggressive defending is I think that transitioning from the block to the press, which we're not very good at, 
I think Mount is exceptional at because he understands his distances and like you even though I wouldn't call it a trigger because you don't really use triggers in football anymore but when the ball gets passed laterally from one center back to the other you should be thinking now is time to strike and Mount will be able to close these distances like Rashford isn't going to Rashford doesn't lead a press Anthony doesn't lead a press it's normally um, the left or the right sided midfielder that leads the press and when I say leads the press uh, what I mean is is that they're the ones that implement the action to change from a block to a press and Mount will be the one that will come out to shut this to shut this angle off here and then you'll see everyone everyone go and we'll put, and you know, with the aim of winning the ball back in an advantageous position so that is what Mount gives us defensively, but as I say, I am very, very confused about how we're going to get Mount, um, how we're going to get Mount into that first line of pressure of Anthony uh, Rashford and I'll just say Martial for now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that we're going to miss out on the best of Mason Mount because the best of Mason Mount is having him in Rashford's position, basically. Um, so I'll just stop sharing there, and we can do do some comments. Yeah. I'll say any questions, please get them in. Where do you see um, Sancho fitting into any of these lineups? Well, Sancho, I think um, I think you have to accept that Rashford, like, if fit and even if not, is always going to start a left wing. Like, um, he'll he like unless something. Dr drastic happens like rational start left with so and then you've got Garnacho as his kind of understudy who come on to come on to stretch games and Rashford will go central um I think that Sancho's best position will be I think he'll be competing with Anthony but Anthony's a hundred million pound signing Ten Hag knows him he's just such a he's such a technically poor ball striker Anthony um but I uh, and, but he is a good. He is good in the press, and he is disciplined. And Sancho, there's a lot of question marks about Sancho's work rate, grit, and determination. As I can, do, you remember we conceded a goal from a corner, and Sancho like didn't make a pass and didn't even bother running back. Stuff like that sticks sticks with players. Um, not a bloody chance is Ahmad getting a go at right wing. <laughs> I'll tell you why, Jeff. He can't last longer than 65 minutes in the championship. I was going like, to say, I've heard that said a lot, actually, by people that watch him say that he he can, he can't make 70, can he? He does about an hour and then has to get yeah. substituted. I don't know whether he's ever going to make it. You know, I know there's a lot of excitement about young players that are signed, but I don't know if he's going to be ever getting a role at Manchester United. Uh, look, if we could get our money back on him, we'd take it tomorrow, I think. I mean, personally, I, I'm most excited by Palestri out of... Um... I would say Palestri took the most of any chance he had and, and always looked pretty good and pretty comfortable. I think he, I love... he sort of might see more of him. I'm going to show his box office. I don't know if you've seen his birthday party, birthday party it pictures. Did. It was, um... I, I think just... with, with Ganacho, is that as a Manchester United fan, when... When you, we've watched so many games, maybe two or three years ago, where we're struggling to do anything, if you put Garnaccio on, more often than not, we create chances. He gets a goal or assist. You could question off the ball, but I'm thinking in terms of if we need to get a goal, we need to create something. There's not many substitutes actually better at the moment to come on for 20 minutes than Garnaccio. I think if he develops like we hope he will do, I think he's uh, you know, could be a really important player in a lot of situations. Um, how he makes this point, saying we're going to have to rotate and having depth on the right is only positive. So, yeah, there's a, obviously yeah. there's a lot of players we're mentioning that hopefully we don't have too many injuries. But if we do, then we do have more depth. That is that is important as well. Yeah, ov obviously depth is is crucial to um, where we're where we're trying to go next season. But I I think we need far more quality on our right hand side. I mean for. For a, a eighty million, sixty million, thirty million pound player, whatever Anthony is, he is not consistent enough at striking a football cleanly to be playing for Manchester United. When he cuts in on his left foot, 
you just don't know. I mean, you know what he's going to try and do, but you've got no idea where that ball is going. He's he, he's not enough of a technician for my liking. I think he lacks pace to be a direct winger. Um, Sancho just seems to lack a bit of heart. But on the plus side, I think when he played against Chelsea, um, in the first half, he should have equaled Anthony's entire assists for the season. So I, I have a little bit of hope for Sancho, but... My main issue with Sancho again is a, is a technical one. Is that like I'm a I'm a slow player, and um, it wasn't until like I got some proper coaching around sort of 21 when I was out in Chile about how um, I never had my weight in the right place when I was dribbling, so I wasn't able to burst. Like I was too concerned with what with what the man I was too concerned with trying to unbalance my man instead of um, being in a position to exploit it. And I see the same with Sancho when he dribbles. He's got the ball on the edge of his foot and it looks beautiful. But even when he beats the man, his weight isn't in the right place in order to go the other side and get and get through. And when you look at Rashford, Rashford actually does have that. He like He can slow his man down and then accelerate past. And a lot of that is where his weight is when he goes. What would you so say... I don't know if you have an answer for this, but how would you say compare those two players with someone like Giggs, who was pretty much was well known for getting past players consistently? It wouldn't always have to use speed; he'd also unbalance players, but and be quite difficult to get anyone near. Would you say he was more like sort of Sancho style in terms of unbalancing? Because he, he could also use pace as well. Um, all right. Well, the first thing is you all got to remember. Um, a lot of people want to gigs out of the United team for about three or four years. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers that, but when, when I was going to Old Trafford, that was every week, uh, everyone was whinging about Giggsy. But if you look at Giggs's, like most famous goal against Arsenal, he essentially just moves in a straight line, but he jinks across the ball and he puts Keown and Adams on, he unbalances them and then goes. We've never seen anything like that from Sancho. Um, Rashford slows players down. I mean, it's it's very like unfair to compare Rashford and Sancho to one of the all timers from the Premier League, um, but they're they're not anywhere near the level of Ryan Giggs at, at dribbling a, a football. Um, yeah, no, I was just thinking because for me, he's like the gold standard. So I was just wondering how they compare. Because yeah. I think maybe we got spoiled by watching someone that good for so long. That. And when you think of dribblers, the two, the the sort of, the three that come to mind are four actually now, for me are Perez, Henri, Rashford, uh, uh, Giggs, and Ginola. Like um, and like okay, Henri was completely different to all of them, where he was um, he was sort of like a much more finessed Harland. Where he moved, it's he understood angles and mo and he didn't like unbalance people. He just sort of he glided past them, but it was an understanding of like of of angles. Um, Ginola was just was a twister, and Giggs was a, a combination between the pair of them. Like Giggs could burst through like a thoroughbred, or he could twist and turn like um, something that twists and turns. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I was gonna say he just seemed to be like quite versatile. That if it, if it if space was it's like tight, me, he curves to the left a lot. There yeah. you go. <laughs> but, I'm gonna have to wrap up in a couple of minutes. But if anyone's got any final questions before I go, uh, about time, thanks for joining. It's obviously Thank been you. another another interesting podcast. And I think that I might try and do you know more of these podcasts where we try and discuss about football rather than. Like, there were some questions about players that I'm going to have to just say, I've just not heard of these players mentioned, so I, I can't really comment too much on how they would do. Yeah, I mean... Well, to, to be fair, there was a player called Anglomar that um, was about 36 or 37. He used to play for Valencia, and he, he was the only player I've ever seen that gave gigs real issues. Year in, year out, we used to bloody play Valencia, and Anglomar was an absolute demon yeah, we did on play the right-hand side. At one point. Yeah, 
Um, but I feel a bit out of practice uh, of doing these sort of like more tactical shows. I normally, I have a Monday with me to talk to when um, Rich is reading comments and things. So um, we could have done a much better job. I'm just going to look at my um, my notes and say, is there? Oh yeah, yeah. There, there are actually there is actually one other thing that I want to say. It won't take um, it won't take any time. But I looked at Mount's um, completion rate for passes over 30 yards. Very very poor. Um, and that basically means switches. Switch, switches a play over 30 yards. You can't switch the ball. Um, and that means that um, in the box, you kind of have to play... Um, you, 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 I mean, McTominay and Casemiro are the only players in our team that can, con that can consistently switch the ball. So we're going to need one of those two players to play all the time if we're going to have, like someone providing the width out wide. Mount's not going to be a man. Bruno's just too Bruno to consistently get the ball anywhere. Um, but all in all, I think that Mount is a really good signing, but there's a lot of there's a lot of things that have to be done. Like, how do we get him in the first line of pressure? Like, who do we put next to Casemiro? Who's getting dropped? Um... And you know what what happens with what happens with Christian Eriksen? Like, is he is is, is Mount a direct replacement for him? And are we going to see no tactical changes? And we're just going to get cut through in the midfield? Who plays right back? I don't know. I know. Maybe maybe we're just seeing a, we're actually seeing a transition to a different style of play. And maybe there is going to be not an ideal team for next season. But maybe with another transfer window or two, maybe he's just putting the places the, the pieces in that he can. He can get in, and after like a 51, 52 minutes of positivity, we'll just end with like, "Welcome, George." He said, "I can't believe it. right." Oh, it's such a shit. Time, ass, time will it? tell, George. Time will tell. I think I'm over. Overall, I'm quite positive about the signing, and I think it's going to be. I mean, George will be quite happy about a new goalkeeper, which appears to be in the pipeline. Hopefully, that's sorted out soon. But I'm going to have to wrap up. And bath time. Thanks so much for joining. Hopefully, we can do this again soon. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, although I'm going on holiday next week, so um, uh, I'm not going to actually. I don't. I don't want to see anyone from the chat. So yeah, good. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for everyone that's been watching. Thanks for the the questions. Expectations for the rest of the transfer window would be Bored probably him. get a striker and get a goalkeeper is I think the minimum but I don't have any expectations really I just want to see the club sold as well and yeah sorry George it's a bit Slab Island George I've, yeah I had to book guests around their favourite programme so bath time is um, <laughs> unfortunately not available around <laughs> Slab <Island. laughs> uh. I would say this, I prefer realism, so I think we just need to see what happens with the team and then we can we can assess performances as and when we see them. I think overall, though, I think it's a good signing. One of Chelsea's a decent players and decent player for England over the last few years. I mean, I'm a lot more positive about this than I was about signing teenagers I'd never seen play or about people that I thought were good about 10 years earlier. So I think that's enough reason. But do you have any, any final comments about time? Not really, no. Cool. In that case, thanks for watching, guys. <laughs> Cheers, Mo. <laughs> Good night. And hopefully I'll be back sometime in the future when... Um, George, don't be one of these people that complains about shirt numbers. It doesn't matter, does it? What we'll do is I'll say, George, just remember this. We'll speak at the end of the season and see whether you think he's, you've changed your mind. Because I'm sure that if we had social media in the 90s, people would be moaning about Eric Cantona getting it because oh, he's a league Beckham, they'd have gone hero. mental about Beckham getting the seven. They'd, be, yeah, they'd gone definitely. absolutely mental about Beckham being given the seven back in the day. Like yeah. You know it's true, Nick. Then he's definitely got like half an hour to prepare for Love Nick, Island, I think. What do you think to... Um, I don't even know if Nick is watching Love Island, but I'm not a fan of Zach and Molly in this light. They're, they're trying to make them like it is like they're trying to do step up to the street with them. 
about all oh, this country girl that likes musical theatre meets a bad boy, but they fall in love and it's all all good. One load of bollocks. I really wish they wouldn't do that. I, I just all I want yeah. is just more know, Whitney. Li- this is just it's like these just spamming names now. I don't know who these people are. But may, maybe a one day I will check it out. But Box keeps warning me that it's, it's, I don't know if it is for me. Maybe I'll check it out one time. But thanks, Bath Time. Thanks, everyone, in the comments. If you like Love, um, Love Island, you've got about 30 minutes, I think. But until then, I'll probably be back maybe next week when we sign some different players. I probably won't be doing much update on the club being sold because I just can't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, it's all scripted, Vaughn. Maybe, maybe. I don't. Yeah, I, d- I, d- I don't think. I don't think so. You can't. Like I don't people think, always um, say this seen... about reality shows. You can't actually make up some of the stuff that they say and do. Like it's... Say, based on the people I've seen, I don't know if they'd learn a script or have the capability of. <laughs> I don't know. Like, just think of like the people that you know in chat and stuff, and like imagine sending Niall, Andrew, Box, George, and. Super Nick and Kate Cadet to Love Island and asking them to follow a script, like the house would be on fire <laughs> by the by the, by the first day. I, that said, I would probably tune in just to see what happens if that was the case. If you I'd just couple up with Andrew, other people I'd in. be so good for him. Like Niall would be, Niall would just be. Imagine Niall in the diary room. Oh, it would be, <laughs> it would be great. Yeah, thanks everybody for watching. Cheers, guys, and hopefully see you soon.